They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Almighty God, you are the ruler of all nations. Everybody in this world and every king and every principality and every power is under your control. And there have been wars and there will be wars and rumors of war. Your, your word tells us that. And as we come on this Remembrance Sunday, Lord, we remember those who have gone before. We remember the saints, the saints who from their labors rest. The one verse of that hymn that we sang, Lord, says, O may thy soldiers, faithful, true and bold, fight as the saints who nobly fought of old, and win with them the victor's crown of gold. Alleluia. And Lord, there's no victory without that battle. And yet we know that you have promised us the victory. You have promised us that we are more than victors in Jesus. We have promised us, Lord Jesus, that the power of sin and death has been vanquished, that Satan's power over us has been broken because you rose from the dead. And we understand that we cannot be removed from this evil world, that the wheat and the tares needs to grow together until the day of harvest. But even as we come today, we come fully aware that we're locked in a battle. The battle, Lord, of which you will be the victor and that we will join the triumphant parade through heaven as the church militant and the church triumphant join together forever and ever singing your praise, glory and honor to you. And so on this day, we thank you for those who have gone before. We thank you, Lord, for those who have ensured that we have an environment in which we can follow you, preach the gospel. Know a degree of freedom in, in the things we do. We pray for those who right now are being oppressed. We pray for those, Lord, who are in government, under governments that, that do not allow them that freedom. For churches that today could not meet and we come and we say, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have given us that liberty. And may we never misuse it. May we never take it for granted. But may we truly know, Lord, that it is the victory that you are giving us in all things. And even as we pray that, Lord, we, we recall those words that we sang. But lo, there breaks a yet more glorious day. The saints triumphant rise in bright array. The King of glory passes on his way. Alleluia. And oh Lord, we want to see you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We want to be part of that parade, part of that celebration forever and forever. And so we pray for this world. We pray for places of conflict we pray for places, Lord, where innocent people are being drawn into violence. We pray for those who even today are sorrowing because they have lost loved ones in violent conflict. We pray, Lord Jesus, for politicians who seek their own selfish ends and power. We pray, Lord, that you would find us obedient in serving you, that we would not be led astray, that we would not be persuaded to abandon the kingdom that to which you have called us. And so we come and we say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. May your kingdom come. We pray that every week. We pray that every service. Even as we pray it together now and we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to read the scripture now from Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 1. And for a change, I will be reading from the Revised Standard Version. You've always got to be careful of the preacher who keeps changing the version of the scripture that he's reading from because he's looking for things to support his sermon. However, the NIV from which we normally read um, doesn't make use of the word saints. And uh, it's a good translation from the Greek for all the saints who from their labor rest. And the more traditional translations do make use of that word. So I decided to use my old trusty Revised Standard Version. Hear God's word as we read it together. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed the whole world is bearing fruit and growing so among yourselves. From the day you heard and understood the grace of God in truth. And as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding to lead a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all the endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. I was born in 1945, the year that World War II ended. And for those battling with the calculation, I see fingers moving. This year I'm 077. My earliest memories involve a country of South Africa recovering from war. Friends whose fathers or brothers or sons did not return from up north. Regimental bands playing on bandstands in parks on Sunday afternoons. The cadet band playing at Forest High School and me nagging my mother to take me to see them. My mother sifting government flour to be able to bake cakes. Going to warm baths for our annual holiday because that's all that petrol rationing allowed for. And at high school, many of our teachers had returned from active service up north. And in a boys' school, they were quite regimental and harsh. And I jumped at the opportunity to learn to play the bagpipes and be part of the school band. And that same school was well known for its very moving Remembrance Day services. And the pipes would play the lament, the flowers of the forest. Not just at the school, but at memorial services across the Witwatersrand and organized by military units and by moth shell holes. You see, it's in my blood. I will later today watch the Remembrance Day service from the Cenotaph in London and I will again be deeply moved. 
But there are very few who survived the Blitz and the Battle of Britain, the carpet bombing of Dresden, the strategic bombing of Berlin, the beaches of Dunkirk and Normandy, the desert rats, rats of Tobruk, El Alamein, Tripoli, that are still alive. And in, in my childhood, the afterglow of Allied victory brought a stream of films, mostly in black and white, from J. Arthur Rank, from Pinewood, Elstree, from Hollywood. Making names like Douglas Bader and Sailor Malone, Montgomery and MacArthur, heroes. And that's what I was raised on. They were heroes and they were some sort of saints. And today we remember them. And the World War I ended on Friday the 11th of November at 11 o'clock in 1918. And we remember those who fought for causes in which they believed and others who had to be dragged into it, who had to, to be brought into the war. Many years ago I was in Albury in Australia on Anzac Day. There was a parade going through the streets and the parade was being led by a group of men and women in uniform. They were amputees. They were in wheelchairs. And they were there because of the Pacific Treaty with the American, uh, with the United States of America. And Australia and New Zealand were dragged into a war in Indochina that they didn't want to be in. They were in Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam. And they had this treaty and they had to go. One day I stood with a host in Kaiser Wilhelm Square at the Memorial Church outside the Tiergarten in, in Berlin. And Herbert was uh, some years older than me. And he could remember that, that Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church, the, the, the bombed steeple is still standing there. And uh, he could remember the sirens and he could remember the air raids. And I encouraged him and he told me what it was like being a child in Berlin. Something which I only knew from the other side because that's where my roots were. And you know, people are dragged into war. They're living in the battlefield, the battle area, like the civilians in Ukraine at the moment. There's a call to arms for folk and fatherland, and they respond and they get dragged into it. There's conscription, and conscription isn't something that we only have to deal with in South Africa. It goes back to the feudal system. Each lord had to send so many people to fight. And it's not only the soldiers that die. Because they die, they're not necessarily heroes. And they are certainly not saints. Who are the saints? Well, if you go to Google and you look up saints, you get soccer clubs, you get shopping centers, you get schools, you get uh, bands, rock bands, you get them all. But who are the saints? Those who have been canonized by the Pope or by the Eastern Orthodox Church? Certainly not. Scripture is much broader than that. Throughout the New Testament, long before the concept of a Pope was even dreamed of, the saints are referred to. Those being sanctified, being made a saint. That's what sanctified means, being made holy. Those who are called to be a holy nation, as God called the Jews to be that holy nation in the Old Testament. And we heard it in our reading. Paul speaks there, he says, We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. We've heard about that, how you love those who go to heaven. 
He goes on, he says, From the day you heard and understood the grace of God in truth, you've been at this concern. We give thanks to you, we give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. And so in the, in the biblical, scriptural context, you and I are the saints. The people who are set aside for the single purpose of serving God, who have given our hearts to him, who said, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And we've done that. And that is sainthood. And that is sainthood. And here it is, guys, in verses 13 and 14 of that passage. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. And that's what it means to be a saint. Jude, in his very short letter, is writing to warn believers to, to stand firm. And he says this, he says, I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. I felt I had to urge you to contend for the faith that was once entrusted to the saints. For men have slipped in among you, godless men, who changed the grace of God into license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And that is Jude's concern. This faith that has been established in the hearts of men and women has been the faith that has been entrusted to you and I as saints that we should not turn from it. And the heroes of the war are not all saints, but they are still heroes. Our loved ones that have gone before may never have been heroes in the eyes of the world, but in our hearts they were. If they loved Jesus, they were saints. They were heroes, and if they loved Jesus, they were saints. On earth, as in heaven. You want to be a saint? Trust Jesus. And yet our faith is built on memory. The Old Testament frequently refers to the memory of what God has done. The deliverance from Egypt. The manna in the wilderness. The conquest of Canaan. Some of the miraculous military victories that the children of Israel won. And we see God's faithfulness in history. We learn God's correction in defeat. Sometimes he lets us lose. Children of Israel were told not to take any loot from Jericho, and they did, and Achan and his family were wiped out because of the, the, the loot that they hid under the floor of their tent. And that was punishment. It was, it was a result, a consequence of disobeying God. And we thank God for those who have brought us to where we are, whether in war or whether in peace. And so we remember. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come and we thank you for those precious memories. We thank you for all that we have heard we thank you, Lord, for, for every memory and every story and every account that has been passed on. We thank you for those men and women who were righteous in the face of conflict and fear, for those who went through the Holocaust, for those who went through bombing, for those who raised families under difficult circumstances. And we come, Lord, and we say, Lord, Thank you for them. Thank you for those who've died in bringing us the gospel. Thank you for those who have made sure that we today stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. And so we remember. Amen. For those who are at home listening in, you will not know what we're going to be doing in the church now for the next little while. 
the members of the congregation are going to go forward and place flowers into a large cross that Wendy has arranged for us. There will be a recording of the traditional lament, the flowers of the forest played through the sound system. And then when that is over, after about two and a half minutes, the words for Amazing Grace will come on the screen and we will just sing unannounced as Tamlin starts to play the tune and, and uh, we will be in meditation. So if you want to sing along, if you want to sing it, you can. Uh, you can think about it. Uh, the Flowers of the Forest is, many people associate that with the with the Flanders fields, but it, it's not. It's much older than that. It's about 400 years older than that. And it was written after the Battle of Flodden when James IV was killed. The, uh, King James IV of Scotland was killed uh, by, the, by the English troops. Uh, but it has been accepted and taken on by monarchs and by Remembrance Day services and regiments, and it is the official lament of Canada. And so it is a lovely song, and, and it's just, uh, it's not a song, a tune, and, and we're just going to listen to that. But you at home, uh, you may want to be celebrating in some way, and you may want to go out into the garden and pick a flower that's there and put it into a, a glass of water, or, or you want to look at a photograph and be reminded of the ones that have gone before and brought you the heritage that you have. God gave Aaron a blessing to say over the people, and we share that blessing now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs> 